Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. I am Debbie, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I, too, want to thank the committee for inviting me. It's really been delightful. Um, I've enjoyed seeing old friends and um, meeting new friends. And um, I also have enjoyed having Natalie as my hostess. She's been a delight. And when she wasn't available, I had John as my backup. So I've really been well cared for, and so I thank you. I've heard a lot about FOTS, but I didn't know it went outside of Colorado, so I'm just thrilled to be a part of this, and I've joined the, enjoyed the sessions and hearing the different experiences on the steps, because that is the recovery program, the 12 steps, and it took me quite a while to realize that it was more than just about not drinking and going to some meetings, that Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of recovery, and it took me a while, but... Uh, so that's, uh, uh, you know, I thank you for this opportunity. And every time I'm asked to, especially on a Sunday morning, speak somewhere, I am just so grateful. I know exactly where I was last night. I don't wake up sick this morning because I used to have not just hangovers, violent hangovers. I mean, it was, it felt like, you know, shoot me, because they, they were violent, and, and I, I get migraines, and they are uh, not as bad as the hangovers used to be. So they're always my kind of reality check of what it used to be like for me. And I, uh, I love waking up alert and, and knowing what happened the previous night. Uh, we were talking earlier in the conference about our cars. And boy, I'll tell you, that's the first thing, if I woke up at my house anyway, uh, well, I would shoot up and throw that curtain back and see if there was a car out there. And then usually it was a relief if it was, but question, how did it get here? Because I don't remember it getting here. And if it was absent, then a different set of problems would begin. I would start wondering, now, where, where do I start looking? And um, so it was always that. That was the, that was the wake-up of every morning when I was drinking. But when I came back to you many years ago, um, I finally hit my bottom. And for me, and in the experiences I've heard of so many others, bottom is an inside job for me. It wasn't an outside event. I had had lots of outside events that my parents and teachers and employers and police could have said, my God, can't you see what you're doing to yourself? Did, here you are again. Did, the hurt you're causing, the problems, the embarrassments of picking me up at jail one more time. I mean, those outside events did not blip on my radar of concern. But the day finally came, the night finally came, whereas the result of a little alteration that I did, I was finally sick of me. We hear the sick, tired of, sick and tired of being sick and tired. We hear I'm done, surrender, desperation, um, willingness. Whatever that might, verbiage might be for you, it's all correct. My definition of what happened was just silent resignation. I just finally internally flatlined emotionally and spiritually and mentally, just finally zeroed out. And I was so sick of the big eye running my life, which was pointless, directionless, useless, that this is what, again, had to happen for me to come to that point where I was finally willing to do what you do. I don't even know what you do, but... I was willing to do something different. And I went back to that meeting I'd been attending once a week, which seemed like a lot of meetings once a week. <laughs> and uh, I, I did something different also. I went early. Now, to me, I used to arrive at this meeting, started, leave when it was over, got her done, was you know basically my attitude about what AA was. And then, here I went 20 minutes early. That was like comparable to me to be going the day before. Okay, that's what that felt like. 
And so I get there early, and um, to me, in my home groups and my regular meetings, if I'm there less than 30 minutes before, I, I feel like I'm late. That's just because, to me, the, the meeting before the meeting and the fellowship helps prepare me for the meeting. And when I arrive as it starts, I'm not prepared. I'm not spiritually ready for the message, whatever it's going to be. I'm getting coffee or sitting down or saying highs, waves. That doesn't work. I am not ready to receive anything. And I feel like one more time it went on the checklist of things to do. And when my spirit is not involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and it's become a checklist item, my experience has been I'm in trouble. I, that is not a good place at all to be. And so I arrived there early, and I, I went to the old-timers, and I asked the most important question of my life, and still is. I said, what do you do to stay sober? End of question. For me, that wasn't going to be any, well, I'll think about it. I'm too young. I, um, don't, I don't like that step. Uh, I don't, I don't want to make amends to people. I don't want to be in service. I'm, I'm, I, there wasn't anything verbally or in body language to contradict or refute anything they were going to tell me. It was the first time that somebody that's self-righteous and arrogant and ignorant and uninformed at the same time was willing to ask somebody else for help, willing to ask the question, what do you do to stay sober? Your life is so much better than mine. I, I don't know what you do, but it doesn't matter. And they told me a series of things. And the first thing they told me, the first three things really would become like my personal triangle of the basis of recovery that everything else bloomed off of. And that was a sobriety date, a home group, and a sponsor. Everything else, the studying of the book, the taking of the steps, working with others, service work, et cetera, et cetera, they would all kind of come under that umbrella of that triangle. We have the triangle of our fellowship, which is the 12 steps are the legacy of recovery. Um, the 12 traditions are our legacy of unity and the 12 concepts, the legacy of service. And it's very important to me that the three are all, all applicable in my life. I'm not just the 12 steps. I've needed to have incorporation of all of the, our principles. And to apply the traditions and the concepts in the personal way as well. This has given me so many more tools on how to live and work with you. And so the first thing they said is one day at a time. We don't take the first drink or anything else that affects us from the neck up, and we get a sobriety date. And I, I took that day as my sobriety date, and that was February the 8th, 1976. And as Natalie said, that means I've been sober a little over 35 years. Uh, it also means I got sober really young. I, I was five when I got sober, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thereabouts, thereabouts. <laughs> Emotionally, I was five, definitely, and for a long time. But I was 18 years old when I got sober this last time. This might not be my first time to AA, but I hope it will always be my last sobriety date. And I, I learned I am 100% responsible for my physical sobriety. I'm responsible for what I take. You know, I don't do wine sauces and foods. I, I don't drink near beer. I don't smoke near pot. Um, <laughs> I don't take health store speed. I don't do any of those kinds of things that my little brain will start justifying away because I am an alcoholic described in the doctor's opinion that says that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And you could have pointed that out to me on my very first night of drinking, and that would have been applicable, but I wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. And let me tell you something. I didn't just like the effect. I loved the effect produced by alcohol. And it just, I just couldn't get enough. And so I am 100% responsible for my physical sobriety and my welfare in that regard. But I used to think it was all about you just don't drink and you go to those meetings. And I've got to believe that they probably said a lot more information, but my willingness and my ability to hear anything was, was so zero. And so my mind says that's what AA is. And I, 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 in order to have a sobriety date and a 
apply to Tradition 3 that the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking, I needed to have started drinking, okay? In some areas I've been in, it doesn't, my, my area doesn't seem like that matters much that you've had any drinking involved. But it does matter. This is part of our gift of identification. I know that many of us have additional problems, addictions, struggles, dilemmas, whatever you want to call it. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, to me, it is important that I have a drinking history. And, and so I started drinking uh, at age 12. I had always wanted to be a Southern Belle, and I was born in South Dakota. So uh, I started in, in the South, um, <laughs> South of the Dakotas. And I was born into a really nice Family. I was an only child. Um, these are these are non-alcoholics. Uh, these are nice, good, hardworking, tax-paying, mo- lawn mowing, cookie baking kind of people. Okay, and they were social drinkers. They I, I still to this date never seen either of them drunk. I don't even know how many decades it's been since my mother's had a drink. I mean, their life did not revolve around it. They would have this literally dusty whiskey bottle on the top shelf in one of these cabinets. Dust implies lack of usage, okay? And it was dusty till I started drinking. And then I started to help them out. Uh, they, They provided such a nice environment for me, but then, but then there was me, you know, what I'm made up of. And I uh, had been invited on a Monday by the cool kids in school for a party coming up on Friday night. And I looked around, and, you know, I'm 12 years old, and it's not unusual to have a want to, want to uh, have a group of friends to run around with. I mean, that's natural. That's human. That's not alcoholic. It's just human being. And But the kids I was attracted to, I didn't fit in the athletic group by any means. I didn't fit with the academics. But these kids were smoking cigarettes, skipping school, drinking beer, and I was I was a drag to that group. <laughs> and when they invited me to the party, I'll tell you what, wild horses could not have kept me from that party Friday night. And I woke up Friday morning with uh, my usual thoughts, which was be a good daughter, obey the rules, be a good student, you know, do the right thing. And that's still my, just part of my makeup, is I want to do the right thing. I'm not a rebel, I'm not a a fighter. I'm not a rebellious person at all. It, this is just the way I am. But then the second thought was, I'm going to get drunk tonight. Now, I don't even know how you get drunk, but I just kind of figured you probably have to drink a whole bunch. And I looked at this as my one opportunity, my debut. Um, and it was a debut, I'll tell you, uh, to be accepted by this group of kids. And I've got to do it right. And um, so I defined right for me. And we got to that party that night, and it's, when you're 12 and 13 years old, it's like a liquid potluck. You know, whatever buddy stole and brought from their parents, and really God only knows what goes in the punch bowl, you know. Um, but they were passing a bottle around in a brown bag, and I just couldn't wait till it got to me. And because I was sort of wanting to act cool, like I do this all the time, I was watching how they did things out of the peripheral, and it got to me and I did what I saw them do. They took a big old pull off that bottle, and they glug, 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 and gave it to the next guy. And when I did that, I was completely unprepared for what that was going to taste like, let me tell you. I've got, I'm doing somersaults on the inside, trying to look cool on the outside, but I am going through a majority of flip-flops on the inside and trying to act, act like I do this all the time. And it, it, just, it just ripped out my throat. You know, I just was so unprepared for that. And yet, in the back of my mind, there was this thought, don't worry about it. You can always get another throat. Just keep going for it. Go for it. You know, I just, it was not a deterrent at all. And a few moments later, uh, that decision was solidified because... It was like hot lava. It was thick, it was warm, and it was quiet, and it just went down, and it filled in all the holes in my gut, and I didn't even know there were any. I didn't take that first drink to run away from a horrible home life I described where I came from, I, 
or I'd been dropped off from another planet or couldn't stand my own skin. I just simply wanted to hang out with these kids and be accepted. But the effect on alcohol for me was quite immediate. And and I uh, there, was, there was no parade that went off or anything, but my shoulders relaxed. And I'm 12 years old, and there's this unique warm glow two inches behind my belly button. I'm thinking, you know what? Oatmeal has never done this for me. <laughs> it still doesn't. And uh, I don't know what's in there, but I want some more. And I, that more now was an immediate kind of thinking for me. It came around the second time, and I want the same result, maybe a little bit more result. So I'm going to do the same action. And I do. I take a big old pull off that, glug, 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 pass it on to the next guy. It, my throat's a little seasoned now, so it's not quite as destructive. But when it goes down that second time, if there is a line we cross from social to alcoholic drinking, I just leapt over that line like a pole vaulter. I mean, that, I didn't know I had just had the one and only social drink I will ever have. <laughs> didn't know it would be important to notice. <laughs> I kicked off alcoholic style drinking from from that point on. I moved in 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 my mind and emotions. I moved into an, another room that I loved being in. My first drink was "Please accept me," and drink number two, "Who needs you?" I mean, it was that fast. My attitude changed. Clancy talks a lot about the disease of perception. My perception of you and everything changed in those two drinks, and yet nothing had changed. But my view of it was completely altered. And I loved the new place. I would set a lot of drinking patterns. These are not what make me an alcoholic, though. Not as I understand it, because there's there's two primary symptoms that define alcoholism. But lots of patterns were started for me that don't happen to everybody, or some of them might. For example, that night I would drink as much as I could, as fast as I could, whatever I could. It did not matter. I would have my favorites eventually, but that night I did. It didn't matter. Um, it would be the last night that I shared a bottle of alcohol. Um, Y'all have to have your own. Uh, I'll help you with yours, um, <laughs> but you don't get any of mine. Uh, I would drink excessively, I would have, I would black out, I blacked out night number one. And so that to me wasn't something I crossed a line into doing. I, I, so I assumed everybody else had that. I passed out for the first time. Again, I didn't realize what had happened. And I came to with my first case of the dry heaves and I didn't understand what that was about. Now, none of those things had happened prior to me taking a drink and yet they had nothing to do with drinking. In my mind, I could separate them and began to defend in my mind the right, the fun, the desire to drink. These I just happened, I guess. They weren't looked at as consequences or problems, just stuff that happens. Now, that what defines me as an alcoholic, as I understand it, is the mental obsession. My parents do not have the mental obsession. They do plan their time, their money, their activities, their friends around drinking. And that night and from there out, I did. I had a mental obsession with getting drunk, and I haven't even picked up a drink yet. That day, I was obsessed with drinking. The other thing that I activated was an allergy. I didn't know. I don't have any kind of allergies of any kind. And so I, did, I didn't understand that concept when I came to you to hear about that. But when I picked up the drink, I lost the ability to control my drinking right from the beginning. Whether or not I was going to have a second drink wasn't even a question, wasn't a thought, nor would anything I do for the next several years be of as given a second thought if it had anything to do with the result as alcohol or any other outside issues. It was on. I felt as though, and I look back, I got on that... Uh, moving sidewalk at the airport, and I, I'm i not one that's got a lot of common sense, a lot of natural old soul stuff about him, a lot of vision. I am so right now, and that's all I could see. And everything that was had been important to me began that fade to black. And I was on a completely, I began a completely new persona from that night on. 
looking back. Didn't know it at the time, of course, but things immediately, rapidly began to change. So that's Friday, and, and that mental obsession I told you about, good ideals Friday morning, second idea was get drunk on Saturday morning, those are in reverse. I'm thinking about drinking and everything regarding it starting Saturday morning. The good ideals, well, they'll eventually be off the list because I can't do drinking and them, so they go. That That's just the way it is. Not a, not an issue. So my drinking uh, accelerated at every opportunity I could, uh, mainly at 12 years old. It's weekends, and at 13, the way I'm drinking, I drink whiskey out of a bottle with a beer chaser because I want to get there now. I've never been a wine drinker because it's, it's really slow. Uh, I want to get there right now, and I find that I black out too quickly, and I don't want to be, like, missing out on everything. And so I find things to help keep me alert, keep delay the inevitable blackout. I found things like speed and acid will help you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, you know, they really will. They'll help you get there quicker and in color. And, uh, boy, I'm just like, Sign me up for that program. Uh, and that, that became my state of d direction. And the last year and a half of my daily drinking, it's, I'm 16 and 17 years old, and whiskey and acid are my diet. That's what I do. I don't think anything odd about it. It just progressed ex as fast as I could make it go, but I didn't think it odd. I was trying to be lots and lots of different things. I was trying to be in school. I was trying to, uh, I was never a cheerleader, but I was the, in the pom-pom team, and we entertained during halftime. I really loved that job, because I was, and I was the only one who smiled, they said. <laughs> That's because I'm ripped out of my mind doing that. And everybody on the team knew it. And uh, they would always say, could you please wait to start drinking till after the performance? And uh, uh, sure. Sure. And, you, you know, that that was impossible. Um, and I would try, I had little jobs, and I mean, it was just such a mess. And we talk about that tornado roaring their way in their lives through the lives of others. And, and it was just accelerating so badly. And finally, at 17 and a half, um, my father had tried all human power to relieve me of my alcoholism. And uh, believe me, if, if human power could have done it, and I'm sure in many of your families too, you, you wouldn't have needed AA. I wouldn't have needed to come here. But alcoholism is bigger than that. It's more powerful. And he sought, finally sought professional advice. He was at the end. He did not know what else to do. He was absolutely destroyed by my alcoholism on what to do. And he sought professional advice, and they knew what he was dealing with. And they said, you need to commit her while you still have legal custody to do so. And that was going to run out in a few months. So when I came home from one of those two-week vacations, you know, the kind, you're the only one who knew you were on there, or knew kind of where you were, nobody else does. They're calling hospitals and morgues. And, and I'm like, what? You know, um, I knew where I was most of the time, type of an attitude. Because I had no thought, concern for anybody but the big eye. And they had other plans for me. This was a Friday night, and I love Friday nights. I, Drunk or sober, they are still my favorite night of the week. I had my first drink on a Friday, and I'm going to be introduced to you on a Friday. And, of course, I was given the option of you either go into a treatment program tonight or Monday. And well, Monday sounded fine. <laughs> well, they knew, too, that I would know, be nowhere to be found on Monday, and they said, no, you're going tonight. And one more time, I'm in the back of a police car, but for a different reason. I'm going to be, com I'm court committed to this treatment program. And I'm going to be introduced to you on a Friday night. And I had no idea what you were. I didn't, need, I'd never heard the word sobriety or the word alcoholism or the words Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I got it that after a little while, you don't drink here. And it's not a program for me. You know, I'm not sure why I'm here. I don't have a problem. Everybody, But everybody else seems to think I have one, so I'm court committed. It's I, I'm just going to do whatever I need to do to get below your radar, and then I'm going to go back to my life, okay? And my life was drinking every day. But, I mean, don't confuse it with what alcoholics do. I just like to drink every day and, you know, wallow in booze. Uh, 
So that was my plan. And I would be in this treatment program. Most people were there four weeks. I was there seven weeks. I would be educated on our, our program and the disease of alcoholism. And I would, we'd be taken to outside meetings of AA on Friday nights. And that was not a happy looking situation of what my life was going to look like. Uh, Friday nights in these, you know, it talks about we are not a glum lot. We read a little bit about the day, dumb and boring, boring and gloom. I've been to some meetings that look like that, and uh, they did not become my home group, I assure you that. <laughs> uh, worked for some people, I guess, but that's what I assumed that I was going to be. And then when you're taking me there on a Friday night, I just knew that that was the camper, that that's what it was going to be like. And so I would sit in the farthest back part of the room I could finally, I could get to a friend of mine area calls, behind the paint. I totally understand that location. Behind the paint is where I wanted to be. And I would hear people doing what I'm doing today, simply sharing their story and telling of their experience, strength, and hope. And and I would find the differences because, again, I'm not the smartest girl in the room, but I know that if I start I'm relating to you people, I might be one of you, and I don't want to. So I have to rationalize everything. And you would talk about, I, I lost my family because of drinking. Many people did. Some never came back. Some were reunited. There's no guarantee on any of that. But my justification was, you know, if you need a family, like, I've got one. You can have mine because I no longer need them nor want them because they're always talking about my drinking. And yet where I really live here, two inches behind my belly button, it had been necessary for me to leave that family because it was no longer a safe home for them. They never knew what was come, what they were going to be there. Bob talked last night about he was a lot more violent sober than drunk. So was I. I was that Jekyll and Hyde in reverse. When I was in the non-drinking stage, I was more the Mr. Hyde. When they talked about um, uh, totaling out cars, my attitude was, you know, I have never totaled out a car officially, you know, okay? <laughs> so, but I had a little drunk car that arrived here. And this drunk car, you know how when you buy them, they start off square? Okay, and then I am the designated drunk driver of my two other friends, and we uh, uh, they could drive sober, so they certainly couldn't drive drunk. So I was the drunk and dr designated driver, and then when you drive like I do, you things get rounded out. You know, the you get the drunk bumps, and you know, cars other cars get in your way, and. Uh, things are missing, and they're falling off, and the window had been shot out of it, and my gas cap was a mitten I had stuck in there, okay? You know, I'm like driving a Maltov cocktail around, basically. It's just... <laughs> mittens cost money. Money's drinking money. Hey, mittens work. I mean, geez, right? So... It, this you know was a little out of touch with reality here. They talked about losing jobs, and I always had this series of little jobs because I was losing jobs, and you know I was fairly a good worker, still am, uh, but the, I, I had problems on showing up and uh, doing things I shouldn't be doing, and I had lost a couple jobs. Okay, I'd been uh, quit before I got fired from a few, but. The last year, I'd acquired a bad habit, and I would quit in a blackout. Well, I don't know why I've quit, so I show up to work the next day, you know. And everybody's surprised. They are. I am. and um, it's, it's, it's just awkward. You know, those are just awkward times. And, uh, you know, so here's my justification for these things that I've been doing, but in my own small way, I can be relate to these people. But there were two things that really bothered me, and one of them was that uh, there was a woman who um, they, they talked about uh, broken promises, and I realized I hadn't been able to keep a promise since I took that drink at 12 years old, because it always ended up with be good, which meant don't drink or take any drugs, and I could not do that. I, I mean, I wanted to, but I knew I, I wouldn't be able to do that because I didn't want to do that, but what I really was was just a blip on my emotional radar because when I took that first drink, the curtains of care closed. They just closed. And 
I was sorry to see the look on my father's face all the time and the problems I caused him. It was never meant to be personal. It was never meant to do that. And yet I didn't have the ability to do it on my own. And I didn't know that. And then they taught, there was a woman talking about trying to scrub away the smell. And uh, I've had this funny odor for about a, a year. And I don't know what it is. And she said it was booze coming through her pores. And I thought, I know that she knows what the smell smells like. About a month ago, I was on a 12-step call. And one more time, the used booze fragrance was very prevalent. And I'm so glad it was not on me. I'm so glad it was not on me. And so um, those were the, some of the things that I heard you say, but, but I wasn't ready for what you offered. I went to a halfway house in Minneapolis, and I did the bare minimum, which is my first awareness looking back of by doing the bare minimum for me is not efficient, not effective, not sufficient. Um, don't drink, don't take any drugs. That's kind of a no-brainer in a recovery home. People are wanting to change their lives. And, and go to one AA meeting a month. Okay. Uh, well, I, one a month, I can do that. I, I mean, I'm not going to go to like two. Uh, join AA, go to two. No, I don't think so. And of course, naturally, I walked in when it started, left when it was over, got it done. And somewhere in those early days, I heard a phrase like, your actions, and this includes today's actions, are either on the road of re recovery or they're on the road of relapse. What are they? So when I it was during this next seven months, I glanced over at the road of recovery, but I kept the road of relapse very clean, swept off, and, and, and clear. I'd stick, keep in touch with my old friends. I'd go back there now and then. And so I, I gained no ground. I gained no spiritual foundation, no step foundation. I simply didn't drink. And with nothing changing, it was inevitable the day would come when I would set up the drink. And I did. It was no surprise even to me. And I came to California to visit my mother in San Jose. And I was there two and a half weeks. First week I hang around with the people I used to drink with. Last week and a half drunk and loaded with them. No surprise. But the surprise was that booze was different this time. It was so immediate into the blackout. And that's what it was, is in and out of blackouts that week and a half. I don't have any memory of that. The next thing I knew, I was on a plane for home. And uh, I had the attitude of I've learned my lesson. And that I need to probably go to some more meetings. So I bumped it up significantly from one a month to one a week. I mean, wow. I mean, I, every time the door is open, I'm there, right, is how I felt. <laughs> and uh, I went to this Sunday night meeting. And again, I told you I arrived when it started, left when it was over. No participation. Don't stick around to say, come and go. And I, five weeks later, on a Friday, I get a letter in the mail with one joint. And I decided to keep it because I thought, well, you just never know when you might need something like this. I had never liked pot. Again, too slow. Uh, makes you eat. It's just, you know, a nuisance. Um, but it was there. It was there. And this, is a re this has always been my reminder that I'm not somebody who, uh, and I'm, every, everybody's choice in what they do in their home is their choice. But I'm so glad my husband and I are on the same page. We don't have alcohol in our home. Uh, we, we don't serve it. Um, it's just the way it is. Um, I have had too many times and moments in these years of recovery sitting without warning notice, bam, the thought flies across my mind. Yeah, there's some whiskey in there. I'd have some. Where did that come from? I mean, I wasn't thinking about it. I'm not having a bad day, a great day. I'm just sort of in normal world, right? Where does that thought come from? Alcoholism. And so I, these are some of the ways that I protect my physical sobriety so continued recovery can happen. So I, uh, the minute I, uh, 
opened that envelope, my mind started working. I wasn't telling anybody on this. I kept that secret. And I started plotting and planning and maneuvering and manipulating and figuring out when I'm going to smoke that one joint. And, uh, you know, because it was amazing because I needed it the next day. Okay. Um, I knew I'd need it someday, just didn't know it'd be the next day. And, yeah, right, you know. I mean, I started maneuvering on that right away. And I, that Saturday afternoon, I smoked that one joint, and I had no idea that that'd be the last thing to this day I would take of my own hand of a mood-altering nature. Um, I call it my last and driest martini. <laughs> because for me, it altered my state of mind. I don't have two sobriety dates, one of alcohol, one of drugs. It just was something that was dry. And it was the thing that would get me to that bottom of I can't stand living with me anymore. I am so sick of running my own life with nothing to work with except my ego and my arrogance that's uninformed and ignorant. And I made that decision to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous and ask for help. Ask, what do you do to stay sober? And that's how I got my sobriety date. Um, how I keep it is the rest of the things. So the second thing they told me is that we go to a lot of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and we get a home group. Now, I have lived in four different parts of the country, which I am so grateful to have had that experience of being sober in different areas because it's really kept this closed mind open. That there isn't only one way, there's, there's one book in my opinion, in my experience, but many people approach it, share it, and experience it in their own way. And so I'm really grateful. So I've had, as the result of moving, I've had four different home groups. Um, and uh, as, when I made this last move, I also realized that I've also had four different last names. Okay, so when MJ said, MG said, Harris, that was my prior last name. So it's always funny how many people know all of my last names, and I've known them a long time, you know. <laughs> but I lived in Minneapolis, and I lived in Atlanta, and I lived in Long Beach in Southern California, and I'm currently in Concord, which is in the East Bay of San Francisco. And my home group is the primary purpose group. It meets 8 o'clock on Thursday nights in Dublin. I live in Concord. Dublin's about a 25-minute drive away. Um, my area, they're very comfortable with a five-minute drive from their home. That should be their meeting schedule. And for me, again, I'm grateful. My experience has really wanted me to keep it fresh. And so I, I visit and go to a lot of different meetings, but I have three regular meetings I attend. That's the minimum of a week, not just the maximum. The, my home group is a site 25 minutes away, and I'll have people say to me, isn't, uh, isn't there something a little closer than driving down to Dublin? And I said, well, you know, sure, I, there's plenty of meetings around, but this is a group. This is a bona fide, active, in the middle, service-oriented group. And that is what I need. Driving 25 minutes, I leave my home at quarter to seven and I usually in the evening and get home usually about 10, 15. It's an evening event for me. I don't wonder what I'm going to do on Thursday nights. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get there at 7, 15 and, and the meeting starts at eight and I'm going to watch the room come alive and I'm going to work the room and shake hands with everybody and say hello. And then I'm going to be prepared for my home group message, whatever that is tonight. Our format is two 10-minute speakers, a coffee break, and a 30-minute main speaker, so I get to sit back and listen all night, not think about what I'm going to say. I just get to take, take, take. And then the meeting is over, and my commitment this at this time is I sign the attendance slips and make sure everybody's welcome, and it's fun to get to know each person each, each week and, and welcome the new ones. And then it's the fellowship afterwards, and about quarter to ten, ten to ten, they're doing last call lights to get us all out of there. And I'm on my way home and thinking about the meeting and how it, you know, how I just flying home. That's, that's necessary for me to keep it fresh. Cause I've had periods of time where I once again got it done, checked this stuff and it wasn't, there was no spirit and I need and want to have it full of spirit. I want to project that enthusiasm of recovery and that like, Natalie was thinking, you know, they, they get stuff done here and then they go away. 
Well, as earlier has been said over the weekend, someone was there when I showed up at that first meeting. It was a, it was a Sunday night. What if they had said there's a good movie on? S- somebody will be there. Football's on. Somebody will be there. And I walked into an empty room. I don't want that to happen on my watch. I have a responsibility as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous to be there. If I say keep coming back, so should I. I need to do that too. And so I'm really, I love my home group, and a home group has taught me about cur- cur- commitment and and a responsibility and accountability and how to place principles before personalities. And I don't know about your home group, but everyone I've had has had something in common, is they've always had somebody that I think would be much happier in another home group, okay? <laughs> I just know this. <laughs> I just know these things. I never tell them that, of course, but uh, or recommend another group to them. But I, I've learned how I have to place principles before personalities, including my own personality. And that this, I want everyone to have that chance of recovery that I have had, and that's what our literature talks about. So we talk about that, and uh, we talk about sponsorship laws. Sponsorship's been talked about this weekend. I've had been blessed with three awesome sponsors, the first two, one in Minneapolis, one in Atlanta. They have gone on to the big meeting. Uh, my current sponsor, Millie, I've been with for over 24 and a half years. It's a very active relationship because I'm an active participant in it. Um, I uh, respect and adore this woman, and if I had one sentence that defined each of my sponsors, it would be, that's what I want to be like when I grow up. And she is still one of what I want to be like when I grow up. So we travel on and we talk to me, they talk to me about, we take the steps. And many, and this week, weekend has been all about taking the steps. The speakers have talked about taking the steps. And that was the first time I had really taken the steps to the best of my ability. I feel like a lot of times I kind of bumbled along without a lot of guidance or direction. But my life began to change. My first four years, I was very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I went to Atlanta, and I got uh, a sponsor, and I got a home group. And um, I I took a four-year birthday cake, and I got complacent. I thought, you know, you're four years sober. You you know something now. Now, I don't know what I knew, but I knew that I knew it, okay? (laughs) And and I felt that, got to thinking, you know, seven meetings a week, that's a lot of meetings a week. I think I'm going to get some balance in my life. <laughs> I'm going to trim that down to two or three meetings a week. And it quickly became two. And not that I had plans for the other five, like community service, education. No, those five nights were spent with me. And that was not a good plan. And, but I didn't think anything of it. But when you incrementally take away, chip away, take away, chip away, it's as if I had started that fourth year with a square wooden box, but one day at a time I took a little nail file to it. And while it doesn't change all at once, it finally after two years became a small round ball, and I'm wondering what six years sober why I'm so incredibly restless, irritable, and discontented. And I don't know why. And... I found that um, I had a plan. People, places, and things were going to make me happy. Now, that really translates into men, money, and mansions are going to make me happy. Okay? I am on a mission. (laughs) And three weeks later, I met a little fella on a Friday night. Um, And uh, he had all the qualifications I was basically looking for, including the fact that he hadn't had a drink in 13 years, hadn't been to a meeting in three years, but no problem. I'm going to help him. And uh, I set out to help this little fella get back in and enthused and all that, be this little AA couple. And after three months of this whirlwind romance, of which I was the only one involved, um, (laughs) this little guy got married to somebody else. I mean... So I let him go, and um, <laughs> I, it didn't take long to find another little fella, and he had the same qualifications, and we did this dance of delusion for, for three months, and off he went off marrying somebody else, and at six years and nine months of sobriety, I came crashing into AA one more time. I had not had a drink, but boy, that wasn't far off the horizon. I was so miserable, so empty, so zeroed out in every way. 
one more time, the big I was running my life. It's amazing I hadn't picked up a drink. But I, but I knew it wasn't far because I need some relief. The pain was great. And I, at that point, I recommitted myself to AA and I've, I've kept that commitment of 110%. And what that looks like to me is I know what, what I'm asked to do here. It's then that extra stuff that getting there early, staying later, extra commitment, extra work with others, extra anything that keeps the cushion solid of that 100% and that have that cushion, that 10%. I uh, would later on, uh, at eight, eight years of sobriety, I uh, was sitting, sitting in my home group thinking that uh, I'm, I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. And one more time, because I'm there, a guy talked about his experience, strength, and hope, and he said that he'd been sober many years, and he had that experience of being restless, irritable, and discontent. He said, I realized I was trying to live today on last year's program. That's all I heard the guy say. It totally saved my life. That one remark turned my life in a different direction. And that's why I'm so glad that they taught me in those early days about paying attention, about, you know, not texting and not walking around and not talking to my neighbor and not being distracted either by others or me being distracted in the meeting because that one remark turned my life in another direction because he gave me a completely different way to look at one day at a time. Completely different. I, I know that we don't drink one day at a time, but it, it gave me that this is the day that counts. My prayers and meditation for yesterday were for t- yesterday. Today, they're for today. I started off with prayer and meditation time. It's like this is Sunday morning and it's trying to stay full on Wednesday's breakfast. I need fu- food fuel every day. I need spiritual fuel every day. This is the day that I want to make my mark. No, I'm not going to find the cure for cancer or solve the world's problems. But I can maybe make a difference in someone's life. Just by a kind act. Just by maybe shutting my mouth and not saying what's on my mind. Maybe by just allowing someone else to cut in on the freeway. Just the simplest, maybe the dumbest seeming things. But I'm still living in a peaceful way. That's what counts, is to try to live that day in a peaceful way. And so he gave me that tool. A few years later, I would get married. And I would move to Southern California and after five years and nine months, that marriage would come to an end. And I'd stay in that same home group, uh, even though it was me and the soon-to-be ex-he and the brand-new she. You know, that can get really small uh, sometimes. <laughs> even though there's 250 people in the room, that can get really small. But nobody got custody of the home group, okay? <laughs> I had to remind myself... I don't know what they did, but I needed to remind myself I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. This group means a lot to me. I have a lot of history and investment here. And I only have one job here, and that is to carry the message. And so those, the, I worked the room even harder. And my, my gauge was if I knew where they are or what they're doing, I'm not doing my job hard enough. I have to be more thorough, more intent, more focused. Because, now, again, that doesn't mean that I was perfect. It means that I would go out in the car after the meeting and I could rant and rave and cry and scream and holler in the privacy of my own environment. But when it came to Alcoholics Anonymous, those traditions had to be in place. That wasn't an option. The common welfare of my group came first before my personal problems. What was happening in my life was an outside issue. Those kinds of things, and that I have only one primary purpose here, and that is to carry the message. So you also talk to me about putting the traditions in my personal life and how to have the tools to work with other personalities, to work with the people about me. I then um, uh, went on a little bit longer, and I had to realize that I had to take my own inventory. That when I could, it's always easy to point they, 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 but I really did have three pointing back at me. And when I took my own inventory on relationships, I realized I know absolutely nothing about being in one. All I brought to the table was selfish and self-centeredness and a love for AA. The first two won't get you a lot of mileage. And they needed to have some changes to them. And so like in the ninth step, 
where it talks about if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, and I looked at that phrase and that this is another phase of development for me, is to learn how to start reducing that selfishness and self-centeredness in any kind of partnership, and that if God did have a plan for me of being journeying on this with somebody else, then so be it. But otherwise, but I've got to bring something different to the table. And over the next eight years, I would date some people, and I set my own different guidelines because it was very easy to lose my own self-worth and self-esteem and self-respect. They didn't do it. I did it. I didn't take the proper actions of respect for myself. And so I had to make a lot of changes. And I began to do that. And even though they weren't the one, whenever a relationship was over, I handled all those things differently and in a way that was with some dignity and some grace. And so after eight years, I went to a conference and I would meet my current husband, Kent. Now, he and I have different stories about how we met, but this is my story. (laughs) And uh, we were at a conference and we met and there was no bells and whistles, but six weeks later, we would go out on a date and the rest is history. We've never looked back. Um, I love going on the journey of Alcoholics Anonymous and recovery and life with him. We are not hooked at the hip, but we complement each other. We love AA, and there's, um, you know, he had all the things on this imaginary wish list I had. I didn't know it, and it got pretty specific in some ways. And this was the man that I was to journey with at least for the last 10 and a half, 11 years. We've been together over 11, married 10 and a half. Um, I really do like the fact that I'm sober longer than he is, you know. <laughs> He's 23 years and a very active member. And, uh, uh, yeah, I only use that when I need to, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, He's great. He teaches me a great deal, inspires me a great deal. And after our, for, at our, for our first anniversary, we were back in Atlanta, which is the last of the important people, places, and things of my life that I wanted him to meet. And we were back there on a Friday night, uh, old, my old home group, exciting and fun to do. And Saturday morning I said my prayers, or please help me stay sober, and the things that I do in the morning, I still ask God to help me stay sober. And we were at a luncheon that day with a variety of people, and when we sat down for lunch, there was pre-poured wine on the table. Now, I'm 26 years sober at this time, and... I've been around alcohol. I mean, I don't hang out in bars. I don't test my sobriety. I know how to say no to the waiter. I don't need to give them the explanation of chapter three of why I'm an alcoholic. I don't need to do any of that. I just, I know, no thank you is quite sufficient. Uh, so I know how to do all those kinds of things, but I, I can't remember ever sitting down and it was already poured and versus offered. But that was the case. And I confirmed the beverage and I, Today I might have taken it out to the kitchen or something, but at that time we just moved it out of, out of my arm's reach. I did not know that that experience or that event, that luncheon, would affect in me a six months chemical, physical craving to drink. I did not know that. It, I was aware of how they were drinking, and it wasn't like I drank. I was glad... You know, it was wine. They did the sip, sip, because to me, again, wine was never of interest. It was slow, and it took a long time, and they, who sniffs, right? And, <laughs> and, and they just enjoyed the beverage. And I knew in my mind's eye, that isn't how I drink. It'd be bomb. And I left, we left that luncheon, and I, I just thought, God, that was so weird how that just kind of had this weird effect on me. And like a drunk dream that we have, I kept waiting to wake up. But I didn't. Uh, you know those drunk dreams. When you wake up at 3 in the morning, your heart is coming out of your chest. You, you, it's so real. I have them so real that I'm even coming back into AA wondering, do I have to stand up for 30 days? Oh, God. You know what? I'm just going to move. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to move so I don't have to do that. And, and then you wake up and you think, okay, ho. Oh, Hold on, hold on. Okay, this is okay. This is the ceiling in my bedroom. This is really good. Oh, thank God, that's my husband. You know, I just uh, and not somebody else's. Um, th- that's that's good. Okay, and your heart gets back into your chest, right? I kept waiting to wake up, and it wasn't happening. 
And for the next six months, this feeling, I really don't even, it wasn't a mental obsession. If there was a mental obsession, it was stay safe. I didn't, I don't recall smelling the wine, but it was as if there was a chemical craving, a chemical imbalance that only booze would fix. And the only thing I can liken it to, because I never heard anybody talk about this, so I never know how to describe it, how to relate to it, and it took me a while to even do that. Most women will relate to this, and I know John will too. Chocolate. When you need or crave chocolate, lemon bars won't <laughs> fix it, okay? It, it can be such of a case of, give me the chocolate, and nobody gets hurt. You know, I mean, that's serious in our life, right? Well, that's how this was feeling, and it kept circling back. Heavy light, heavy light, but it never left. I was micro-inventorying and looking at my life. What takes people out? Because I've seen over the many years, before they take the physical drink, the drink started in another fashion. A resentment, a loss, broken relationship, a little stealing from the office, a little lying here, a little inappropriate behavior, secrets begin, and the day comes when you need that relief and AA doesn't seem to have an answer anymore because I've pulled myself so far away from it that I find the only thing that gives me that relief is a drink. So I started looking at any of those things and I'm not doing any of those things. I have no secrets. I'm not lying, stealing, cheating, doing any inappropriate behavior. Are you active with a sponsor, with your God in sponsorship? All of those things were powerfully in place. And I know that there was a God actively working in my life because the buffer between me and that drink, I felt that power each day. And sometimes it was so spooky that I felt that I would be, I'd have almost like a Stepford wife brown out or something and drink against my will. It was not a fun time. It's not an easy time. But I, it, it wasn't going to win. And it's about six months, and I'm at a meeting one morning, and the meeting's over. I'm feeling fine. I don't have any, you know, other than just normal life happening. And on my way home, I am gripped to my core with the fear that I would drink against my will. And I got on the phone to my sponsor, and I'll tell you what. I wouldn't dream, personally, of being without a sponsor. I don't want to have to debate who should I call with this crisis. There was no doubt in my mind, and I, I choose not to have my sponsor on speed dial. If I, uh, I need to know that number in here, so if I'm ever in a coma, I can just lay it out there. That's me. I want to have that physical connection with her in that way as well. And she answered the phone, and God knew I needed her more than anybody else on the planet that morning. And I told her what was happening, and I was so afraid I was crying. And uh, rarely do I cry except happy tears. I don't cry sad tears very often at all. Happy tears, watching God work in your life and mine, make me a little blubber. But on this day, I'm crying out of fear. And she listened to me, and she said something I've heard before. It wasn't new, but it was exactly a message. She says, honey, what we have is the disease of alcoholism, not alcoholism. And uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, it just gave me the first exhale I'd had in a long time. I'm not defective. I'm not doing anything wrong. I have a disease that will always be active. It took me to two places in our literature that morning in my mind of what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. That is why I got to stay sober. I had a strong condition. I maintain that on a diligent daily, not when it was good, not when it was just bad, on a regular all-time basis. That was why I got to have that reprieve. A reprieve in the dictionary says a delay of the death sentence. When I look at it like that, it kind of has a punch to it, you know, it's got a little salsa in it. Um, and the other thing it took me to is that we read it in chapter three over the weekend that I am in the grip of a progressive illness over any considerable period of time. It gets worse, never better. Just because I stopped drinking doesn't mean my alcoholism went to rest. Uh-uh. I saw that in the seven dry months I had, it went kapow. 
It was as if I'd been drinking the whole time. Mine did not take a break until I picked it up. And so I felt that. I realized if I am in the grip of a progressive illness, I had better be in the grip of a progressive recovery. One more time, I cannot be living today on last year's way of life. These things today constantly evolve and shift in my life. It is a one day at a time program that I've gotten to put a lot of days together, 13,025 to be exact, if anyone's counting. Uh, this is the day that counts. This is the day that I've showed up. This is the day that I'm here to serve however I can. This is the day for me to be useful instead of useless, to be the giver instead of the taker, and to be present instead of absent. And for sharing this day with me and inviting me to Fonts, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for being here this morning, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.